I'm Officer Cadet Martinez Chung, and in this lesson, we will learn about aircraft performance. So let's start off with a definition of what is known as torque. So the propeller is, whatever we're looking at from the view of the pilot, is rotating clockwise. So if we're looking like this, then our propeller is going to be rotating clockwise, like so. Okay. So the reaction to this spinning propeller causes the aircraft to rotate counterclockwise. So just because of weird physics and sciencey stuff, then as the propeller turns clockwise, the, re the aircraft will have a tendency to rotate counterclockwise, just obviously not as dramatically, otherwise that'd be nuts. But yeah. So this results in what we call asymmetric thrust, or can result in it. So, what asymmetric thrust is, is at high angles of attack in a high power setting, so takeoff for example, then the descending blade of the propeller has a greater angle of attack than the ascending blade of the propeller. You can remember, propellers are essentially little miniature wings that kind of rotate like so. And they just generate, they generate lift, but in the forward direction, so thrust. So in this case, the descending blade will have much greater angle of attack than the ascending one. So this means that the descending blade again will be producing more lift, which will result in more lift on the right side of the propeller as opposed to the left. And remember this lifting force, this is pointing forward, is known as thrust. So that means we will have more thrust on the right side of the propeller than the left side and the result will be a yaw to the left. You will see aircraft, or single engine aircraft at least, will have a lot of tendencies to yaw to the left. And this is just simply corrected by using right rudder. And this is what you'll hear your instructor saying a lot. Right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. In essence. And this can actually be combated in multi-engine aircraft. In some multi-engine aircraft, then you have the propellers spinning in opposite directions. This essentially counteracts this asymmetric thrust. But then there are more ways that we can have that yaw in motion. Like the slip stream, for example. So when air is pushed back by the revolving propeller, it goes in kind of a cruise course through motion following the propeller. And this course through motion, what it does is it creates pressure on, because an increase in pressure on the left side of, of the tail. Or essentially, it think of a deer flow kind of flowing in a course through. Eventually, it hits the left side of the tail. Okay? And this will cause the aircraft to yaw to the left. Again, can't do this with right rudder. Starting to sound familiar? Like the picture. Alright, gyroscopic precession or precession. So, when a spinning propeller, a spinning propeller tends to add like a gyroscope. So, a rotating gyro will tend to stay in the same plane of rotation. So, it, let's say it's spinning upright, and everything essentially is revolving around the gyroscope. The gyroscope will still keep spinning upright. So, the thing is, gyroscopes are hella weird. So, what happens in the procession is, let's say we're applying a force on the gyroscope, or in this case, the propeller. Then the force will have a tendency to act 90 degrees down the direction of rotation and not where it was applied. So instead of being applied at the top of the airplane, so then it will start being applied to the right. So, so since this force is now being applied to the right, this will cause, you guessed it, a left turning tendency. So yeah, gyroscopic precession is weird. You don't really need to know much about gyroscopic precession other than the 90 degrees down the direction of rotation, at least for this course. And if anything, my instructor just told me that this is essentially magic. That's all you need to know. So you kind of see the diagram. So you can see the force being applied on the top of the propeller. However, since it's a gyroscope and they're super weird, then the force will actually act 90 degrees in the direction of rotation on the right of the aircraft and results in a left turning tendency. 
Alright, climbing. So, the ability to climb is dependent on the ability of an aircraft to produce thrust. Which is why, for example, gliders tend to have limited climbing capabilities because they don't really generate much thrust. Anyways, so lip will always act perpendicular to the relative airflow. So relative airflow coming nice and straight, lip will always act straight up. If the relative airflow is coming from the top, kind of like so, then lift will act straight up relative to that airflow. So whenever we're trying to climb, then we just have to increase the amount of lift we generate. Best rate of climb. So what the best rate of climb is, is a rate of climb in which you will gain the most altitude for the least amount of time. So that is usually a typical rate of climb you use on the takeoff roll for your normal climb because you want to get to the air and actually just flying as fast as possible so you have your best rate of climb. This is also known as VY. So for example in a Cessna they tend to be somewhere around 67 or 70 knots tends to be your VY or your best rate of climb. If you can remember and well, one way to remember this, if you're taking any physics courses before, uh, your VY, so Y, remember the Y axis is the vertical axis. So you're going to get your best vertical axis, essentially. That's kind of the way my brain works anyways. Next we have the best angle of climb. So this is the climb angle you want to use whenever you have an obstacle at the end of the runway because this will give you the most altitude in a given distance. So it will be much steeper, much nose high essentially, and it will help you avoid obstacles. Instructors really like to put uh, 50 foot obstacles at the end of runways. And in order to compensate, you need to climb out at your best angle of climb. Your best angle of climb is usually a little bit slower than your best rate of climb. So for example, in the Cessna, if I remember correctly, there's somewhere around the 55 knot range. So essentially, this will give you your obstacle clearance. And once you clear up the obstacle, then you can pitch back down to, to your best rate of climb. So best angle of climb is known as Vx. And again, another way to remember this, if you're taking any physics, then x is the horizontal axis. So Vx, you're getting your best performance in the x direction. Right, normal climb. So, a normal climb is a normal climb. Rate climb that should be used in any prolonged cruise climb. There's not much else to it. Gliding, my favorite thing. So, in gliding there is no power, because who needs an engine? No engines, no problems, right? So, in this case, the airplane is under the influence of gravity. You know, the four forces, we don't have thrust anymore. So, how do we generate thrust in the glider? Well, if you know, look, take a look at gliders flying, you can usually see they don't fly straight and level. They have a slightly nose down attitude. And since they have a slightly nose down attitude, lift is slightly skewed downwards. So what this results in the lift being divided into two components a vertical component that keeps you up and a horizontal component that helps you move forward and there's our thrust so the thrust generated by a glider is just the horizontal component of lift now these are some very important uh, speeds you want to become a glider pilot so first we have the best glide speed for range so the best glide speed for range otherwise known as the best, best L over D if you remember previous lessons, or just your best fly speed, then if you fly at this speed, then the aircraft will tend to glide the furthest distance with the least amount of altitude loss. So if you remember, you can relate this to your best lift over drag ratios. At this point, you're generating the most amount of lift with the least amount of drag, which will get, help you get further with the least altitude loss. So this is the speed you usually want to fly if you had an engine failure, for example, then you don't have an engine anymore, so you want to make it as far as possible in order to have more options. 
or you can also, you also use in a glider pretty much always because you don't have an engine at all. Next is the best glide speed for endurance or otherwise known as the minimum sink speed. So at this speed the aircraft will glide for the greatest amount of time for with the least amount of altitude lost. So your best glide speed for your, or your min sink speed is usually a little bit slower than your glide speed, your best glide speed. For example, in the Schweizer 233 glider, then your, glide, your best glide speed is 45 to 50 miles per hour, depending if you're solo or duo, or an instructor essentially. And your best glide speed for endurance, or min sink, then becomes 38 or 42 miles per hour. Again, depending if you're solo or with an instructor. So it's a little bit slower. So this speed is the speed you should want to fly if you're time building, so building experience in the glider. At that point, you're up in the air, you just fly your min sink speed, you will stay up in the air as long as possible. Alright, next up we're going to talk about turns. Because in aircraft, chances are our runway is not going to be right in front of us. I'm not that lucky. So you're going to have to turn eventually. So, in a turn, then the force lift acts 90 degrees to the wingspan, so it'll act straight up essentially. However, in a turn, what we want to do, since we're in a bank, then a little bit of that lift starts to point to the side. So we're in a roll, remember lift pointing straight up. If we roll to the side, the lift starts to act a little bit to the side. And again, this divides into two components. The vertical component, which keeps you up in the air, and the horizontal one, which is the force that helps you turn. And this is actually one of the reasons you will notice that in flight training especially, whenever you, you start turning, then the aircraft will have a tendency to nose down. That's because you don't have as much lift helping, helping you keep the nose up, since part of that lift is being used towards the turn. So in order to compensate, you usually want to add a little bit of back pressure or nose up thereby increasing the angle of attack of the wings and giving you more overall lift. Alright, so in a turn, the lift force we discussed has two components, the vertical and the horizontal. And the vertical keeps you in flight, the horizontal is the one that helps you turn. This is also known as the centripetal force. The centripetal force being the force that pushes you towards the inside of the turn. Another thing you might hear in aviation, which in this case we consider it non-existent, is the centrifugal force. What the centrifugal force is, is the force that pushes you to the outside of the turn. So, if you think about ever being in a car or in a vehicle, and you take a very sharp turn, your body starts being pushed to the outside of the turn. That's the centrifugal force. And we say that it doesn't exist because it is essentially just inertia, which is the tendency for your body to just keep going in the direction of motion. If that sounds familiar, then you just lost motion. Aha! Alright, so in your turn, there's two different scenarios you want to discuss. First, whenever we have a steeper angle of bank, so let's say instead of 15 degrees angle of bank, we're going 45 degrees angle of bank. Then what's going to happen is, first of all, we have a greater rate of turn, so we're going to be turning faster. We'll have less radius of turn, so we'll be turning much tighter. Then we also have a higher stalling speed, so this is actually bad. You don't want your stall speed to be higher. So if your stall speed is higher, then you will stall sooner, essentially. So let's say in the glider, for example, the stall speed is around 38 miles per hour dual. Then in a steeper angle of bank, then you might have your really, really steep, much higher stalling speed, like 45, for example. At that point, you've reached 45 miles per hour before you reach 38, so you will stall sooner, which is not what you want. Yeah. Another thing, too, is steeper angle of bank will give you greater loading on the wings, so the wings will be exposed to much more force since you're going steeper. Next up, when we have high airspeed in the turn, then when you have a high airspeed, you think about like your car going really fast around the turn, then you will have a slower rate of turn because 
it takes a lot more energy to change your, the direction you're going. Since that high airspeed means you have a lot of energy going forward and a body will have a tendency to keep going, right? You just lost some motion. So it will take a lot more force and energy to get you to turn. And again, this also results in a larger radius of a turn. You have a much wider turn. Alrighty, and that is all. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, queries, or random outbursts, feel free to put them in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, and happy landings.